Thank you for joining Dive Ventures today for episode five of our Oceans Update webinar series. Today, we'll be covering becoming an ocean steward. My name is Sabrina Severin, and I am the Ocean Health Education and Conservation Coordinator at Dive Ventures. I received my master's degree in marine conservation from the University of Miami and have been with Dive Ventures for a little over a year. And now I'm thrilled to int introduce you today to our host, Dr. Alex Brilski. Some of you may be familiar with him if you've tuned into past webinars. Dr. Alex Brilski is the founder of Ocean Education International, a consulting firm focusing on environmental education and professional development for the marine tourism industry, specializing in the recreational scuba sector. He is currently the Director of Education at ReefSmart and is also the author of The Complete Diver and Beneath the Blue Planet, which can both be purchased at your local dive ventures. Dr. Brilski holds a Master of Arts in Instructional Systems Design, a Master of Science in Marine Biology and Coastal Zone Management, and an EDS and PhD in Science Education with a Technical Specialty in Oceanography. He has a unique and diverse background that combines education and marine conservation, and we are honored to share this knowledge and passion with you today. I hope you enjoy this webinar and the important information shared. Dr. Brilski, the floor is yours. Thank you as always, Sabrina. Well, uh, welcome to those of you who've logged in for the first time. What I wanna do this month is a little different. As you'll see here, we're gonna follow the typical format with uh, looking at news events and then the, the main body of uh, the discussion, the travel log, but uh, the first news item kind of inspired me to do something a bit different because there was uh, an important study released about kelp forests. I want to talk a little bit about that and then kind of give you, uh, a, you know, kind of a heads up on a, a wonderful uh, PBS Nature episode that some of you have probably already seen. And then a quick update on some issues related to lionfish, as we discussed uh, in the previous session. Uh, and as Sabrina mentioned, I want to spend most of our time talking about becoming an ocean steward. And then lastly, the kelp forest uh, blurb was uh, inspiration to kind of look at an ecosystem that frankly gets overlooked unless you happen to live on the West Coast, uh, which I did. I spent about eight years living in both Washington State and Southern California. And while I haven't been there for a couple of decades, uh, I've always felt that diving in a kelp forest is just an, a magical experience. And I wanted to take that opportunity and talk about some of the, the uh, opportunities that you have through Dive Ventures to dive this amazing ecosystem off Southern California. So without any further ado, the study I, I mentioned uh, pegged the ecosystem value of kelp forest at a half trillion dollars half trillion with a T. Uh, and you can kind of see in the lower image just how extensive kelp forests uh, fringe the coasts of the, of the world ocean. And while the species differ, these brown alga, which is kelp is a, a collective term describing all of these large brown algae that uh, are so prevalent in these cold water areas. Now, part of their importance is the fact that they're able to draw enormous amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is good. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a different context. And secondly, because they need nutrients, they pull enormous amounts of, 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 of fertilizer, nitrogen, specifically out of the sea. And that's one of the big drivers to phenomena such as uh, uh, anoxic events and, and red tides. The problem is, of course, that they're being endangered, similar to coral reefs, by a warming ocean. While coral reefs need warm water, kelp forests do not. In fact, they really do not like water much above about 55 degrees. And this has really caused some significant problems with regard to kelp forests off of Southern California in particular, uh, because there's been a decline of almost 95% uh, since 2013, and the reason gets to the uh, gets back to a couple of uh, phenomena. In in 2014, a warm water phenomenon known as the Blob uh, be, came into uh, the West Coast of the United States, and it was followed a year later by an El Nino event, 
which drove even more warm water up into uh, off of uh, central and southern California. Uh, at the same time, the st sea star population began to die of what's been termed sea star wasting syndrome, as you see illustrated there at the bottom. And without these major predators, these keystone predators, to keep the sea urchins in check, they began, to, the purple urchins particularly began to proliferate. And unfortunately, one of their favorite, their favorite foods are the holdfasts, the, the structures that keep the kelp uh, connected to the bottom. And so this phenomenon of denuded, what are referred to as uh, urchin barrens, became quite common. And it's still a huge problem. The wasting syndrome has not yet, the, the, the pathogen has not been identified, but uh, it has really caused a, a lot of devastation. In fact, the the sunflower sea star you see there uh, is uh, has been almost extirpated in, in most areas of the West Coast. I'll come back to kelps in a minute, but if you haven't already, uh, I would encourage you to log on to uh, uh, your local PBS station and uh, the recent uh, episode, Treasures of the Caribbean, is very much well worth watching. A quick highlight, if you look on the right there, that uh, that image, that's uh, the southwestern end of the Cayman Trench. And the episode really focuses on a reef system called the Cayman Crown, just outside of that little lagoon you see with at Livingston, uh, uh, Guadalmano. Uh, and what's unusual is that that area being so close to shore and the outflow of that of that river system is relatively turbid and no one expected to see this incredible uh, coral reef system that was so affected by these kinds of conditions so the the video is uh, well worth watching uh, all of the links of what i'm talking about today are, are, are available on the website by the way what is not mentioned in the video, however, is there has been another similar phenomenon a little bit further east in Honduras, off the city of Tela. And in this very turbid uh, lagoonal environment, there is a thriving coral reef system with some of the highest coral cover really found in the Caribbean. So it, it goes to show we don't really understand all that's happening because these reefs should not exist in such a luxuriant state as they do given the conditions that they confront. So take a look at that video when you get a chance. And quickly on an update, uh, the lionfish, as we talked about, uh, was it last time or the time before? I think uh, we mentioned that the potential range for lionfishes uh, given temperature, the temperature regime is depicted here on the right. And uh, unfortunately uh, they have, uh, uh, gotten their way all the way uh, to southern Brazil. As you see, the currents in southern Brazil, as you go south of the equator, you start to get counterclockwise flow in the ocean gyres. And so that's kind of facilitated their distribution down into the southern portion of Brazil. So essentially, uh, they're now, they now occupy the full potential range in the Western Atlantic. So stay tuned and uh, we'll see what happens. Anyway, let's get into the main topic, becoming an ocean steward. And I, I started off with this little statement from Paul Watson, uh, in case you it, he sounds familiar. He was actually one of the founders of Greenpeace, but he thought they were a little bit too, uh, too mamby-pamby, and he went out and formed the, uh, the Sea Shepherd uh, organization, which is a, a very action-oriented group that uh, has been trying to intercede and stop whaling and illegal fishing for many, many, for decades now. So what it, let's start with what exactly is an ocean steward. So uh, I, I consulted an authority on this, and let me show you uh, their definition. Just take a few minutes to kind of look at that. I'm going to give you some insight about this statement here in a minute. Now, the interesting and possibly concerning issue is the authority that I consulted was not a human being. I popped this question into chat CGT, and uh, it was <laughs> astounding to me. 
Uh, anyway, so I, I think that's a, an outstanding definition of what I, I hope to uh, achieve in, in talking with you here today. Let's start with what I think are the two biggest challenges that face marine conservation. Here's the first. The problems with the ocean are out of sight and out of mind. And I would just ask you this question, looking at this ocean environment, what's wrong with this picture? Well, you don't know if you are looking at a pristine ocean or one that's drastically impacted because the problems are going to be hidden beneath the waves. And that's a huge concern. If you're into terrestrial conservation, you know that a, a, a park or you know, a forest or whatever is deteriorating by mere, your mere presence. But unless you happen to be a scuba diver, that's not the case with regard to the ocean. So it really is important for us as divers, we who have this opportunity to actually see what's below the ocean, to really serve as sentinels and really you know, make sure that we communicate what we see underwater. You have this capacity to really tell the story. And I, I really want to encourage you, you know, as you learn more and become hopefully motivated, uh, you know, share the story because you're able to see what's happening. And, and given the concentration of, of the facilities in the, in the Midwest, I just thought I'd show you how, just why, <laughs> you know, everyone is affected and affects the ocean. Because in the case of the Mississippi River, a third of our country is drained by, in that watershed. The second important thing is something I actually mentioned several episodes ago, and that is the shifting baseline phenomenon. So let's take, for example, this image, this diver who's obviously having a wonderful, superb time. But the question, I'm wondering if anyone can really tell me what's wrong with the picture. And to, to uh, keep things short here, uh, the answer is pretty simple. That uh, beautiful coral head that he's so enamored by is absolutely and utterly dead. All of the fuzzy structure that you see there is macroalgae that is long, <laughs> killed this particular uh, Carl head. And, and the point is that he doesn't know any better. He's simply assuming that this is the way things are because on this particular day, as a new diver, this was the thing that he saw. Little did he realize that just a few decades ago, this is what the world looked like. And trying to convey this, I think, is a, a crucial aspect of, of telling the story that's necessary to be an effective uh, ocean steward. Some of you have seen this already. This is a sequence of images over the course of several decades on a single reef off the Florida Keys, Carries Fort, and it pretty much tells the story. I began diving the reefs of the Florida Keys in the late 1960s, uh, so I can attest personally to what you're seeing here uh, tragically. The next point I want to make is what I call the disconnect of diver training. And what I mean by that is we all come, become divers because we want to explore this absolutely magnificent ecosystem that you, you have to be a diver in order to expose yourself to. But when we get into the training process, the unfortunate situation is the whole reason people want to become divers really doesn't get much attention in the process of becoming divers, because as I'll explain in a minute, uh, we just don't do a very good job of communicating the environment to, to divers. And so the consequences of the disconnect is that people are turned out into the environment as qualified divers, knowing very little about the ecosystem and, and mo more importantly, lacking any real connection. You know, it's this mysterious wonder in which they have really no roadmap. And that's that's unfortunate and it's very problematic. So as so many divers begin in their journey without understanding the environment, they're dependent upon the simple joy uh, of the experience, the newness, the sometimes even the danger. And then once that's quickly fulfilled, they end up dropping out of diving uh, because they're bored or you know, it's no longer what it used to be. And, and we lose a lot of divers for that particular reason. Now, this is not conjecture. 
it's not simply my personal opinion. There have been two surveys in the past year that have pointed this out, one of which conducted by the Business of Diving Institute in Depth Magazine found that almost a quarter of all divers felt that they were that they had not been well or very well prepared uh, to understand the environment. And when that question was posed to dive professionals, it dropped to only 11%. So we clearly are not doing something. A more extensive international survey was conducted by uh, the Reef World Foundation, and they found similarly with regard to tourists, 83% were looking to further their education, and even three quarters of dive professionals felt that uh, they that divers were looking for that. So what I'm what I'm conveying, I think, is well well documented. So the question is, why is this important? Well, the, importantly, if we can connect the diver with the experience and really make them in, enjoy what it is they're doing, then they end up becoming an advocate for the environment. And in, in turn, turning their passion into purpose and not just enjoying the experience or having a personal uh, relationship, but actually advocating and helping to change the condition of the ocean. So let's explore just for a minute how attitudes have changed over time. Uh, I have a, a quick snippet from one of the very first uh, uh, films uh, that promoted scuba diving. And I hope the hope the audio comes through well on this. Wherever the naturalist turns, he finds life. If he wants to know the ocean, he must grasp it meet it on its own terms. And the terms may not always be to his liking. He'll find more than he'll ever be able to classify in a lifetime. So today we look at this and I hope we're appalled by, you know, such a disrespectful, you know, invasion of another creature's uh, <laughs> uh, property. So, and you say, well, you know, attitudes have changed, of course, in the, what, 40 odd years that have passed, actually, no longer than that, uh, 60 years that have passed. But I would question just how much have things changed when we see videos like this that are equally disrespectful and, and outright uh, uh, harassing. And it, it makes me question that, you know, are divers really ocean advocates? And I would say... Many are, but I would say by and large, divers are interested in the ocean, but they're not necessarily stewards or advocates. And I think that that needs to change because frankly, the ocean needs all the help it can have. So the first step in making this change, uh, in my view, is instilling a, a different ethic. And what I mean by that is what I like to emphasize with my own students and, and people that I interact with is that we need to encounter the ocean not as a, as customers, but as guests. And that's more than semantics, because if you think about it, a guest's behavior accommodates the host, the ocean. Customers demand satisfaction. Guests respect the culture. Guests and or cust customers expect accommodation. So we really need to change the attitude from one of ego to eco and recognize that humans are not distinct and dom and have dominion over the, the natural world, but rather we're a part of it. And I think that's step one. Step two, with regard to wildlife at least, is the way that we interact. And uh, if you've had a chance to look at my book, chapter 10 actually gets into this in much more detail, but bottom line, what is, what do we need to know about responsible wildlife interaction? The first point is harassment, as such as you've seen in these previous videos, may actually not have harmed the organism, but it did steal something very important. And that was the energy it needed to survive, to reproduce, to find food, to evade predators. And by taking that energy, by having to deal with some, some obtrusive human, is essentially, you know, can be quite expensive. The problem is even an organism that survives and seems unharmed may have paid the price 
but a diver won't be around to see the consequences. So the idea of energy budget, that organisms have only a certain amount of energy derived from the food that they get, we need to take into account. Of course, we want to avoid touching wildlife in general. <clears throat> we want to follow best practices. And we want to back off, of course, when we see signs of, hey, get out of my face. Because, you know, the flight or fight response will eventually result in what you see here. The organisms can only, will only take so much before there are consequences. Now, what is important to know is that we now understand what people want in terms of a, a wildlife experience as illustrated here. They want to feel connected, they want to learn, and they want to feel that that experience is natural. They don't want to go to Disneyland when they go underwater. Uh, this brings up an issue that you might encounter, fish feeding. Uh, the image on the left, by the way, I took many moons ago. You can tell from the front mounted VC. And what the diver is doing there is he's spraying canned cheese into the water column to attract those yellowtail snapper. Little did we know that that actually clogged their gut. Uh, and so it was a very different time. We now know that this results in alteration of the community structure. Uh, of course, as I said, it has a potential hazard uh, to uh, as a the food source. Uh, I've seen everything from hot dogs to gummy bears fed to fish. Uh, today, especially this Disneyland image is really not appreciated. And then lastly, it habituates fishes to the point where there can be uh, injuries. And we'll see a little bit of that a little bit later. In fact, we'll see it right now. You might, uh, you might, Go back here for a second. You look at the image here. This is my good friend, Spencer Slate, whom I've known for oh, 30 plus years. And he learned the consequences of interacting with more eels and that he can only count to three on that uh, right hand. He lost two fingers recently to that more eel. So there are potential consequences in a very direct way. Uh, but is any interaction with marine life inappropriate? And the answer to me is no. All of these images shot long ago uh, were, I think, appropriate because they fulfilled three important criteria. One, it was a free choice of the organism. Secondly, it did not alter the behavior. And thirdly, it was not done purely for entertainment. I think that when we interact with marine life, there needs to be some educational experience, ideally facilitated by a professional, but not necessarily. And so we come away with an understanding, not just an emotional, possibly life-changing experience. By the way, the circled image there, that's a Pedersen's cleaning shrimp doing exactly what Mother Nature intended, cleaning. In this case, it happens to be the little follicles on my wife's hand. So some of these interactions can be quite, um, quite magical. Let's move into a different realm. And one of the ways of being good stewards underwater is not to damage it. And here we get into issues relating to buoyancy control. And this is kind of geared mostly to the professional folks in the audience. Uh, the way we train divers, I think, is problematic in that we we, we overweight them to control them and they get used to wearing too much weight and you end up with situations like that. And I would just encourage instructors to kind of re-examine that. And I, I've provided some links. And I think, you know, we really want to concentrate on buoyancy control, proper trim and proper propulsion. And if that could be mastered uh, in the confined water and pool sessions, I think we'd see very, very different behavior. And I would make that charge to the dive professionals in the, in the audience today. This brings up, of course, the issue of underwater photography and what responsible underwater photography is all about. And I sometimes hear from, well, you know, this is a problem from, from, uh, from novices who are, you know, interested in getting selfies and the like. Uh, but I would contend that it's not just the novices. Here we see an absolutely egregious example of a, a bonehead who's 
really not concerned at all as long as he can get the photo he wants. So this is really, this is an issue for all divers who take cameras underwater. So please be responsible. On the selfie image or the selfie issue, uh, one of my reviewers for the Beneath the Blue Planet, uh, Dr. Chantel Pagel, uh, uh, this is part of her dissertation research. Uh, she was looking at the change in diver behavior based upon the recent selfie culture. And, and you know, as you might expect, this is causing problems as well. So, you know, just because you want to get a picture doesn't give you license to uh, be irresponsible. Now, one of the things that's important to expect responsible behavior is that divers need to understand what is and isn't acceptable. And there are guidelines and best practices, uh, even to the extent that some operators now are providing what you see on the right here. This is a more or less a, a almost a liability release, at least, uh, you know, uh, informing divers of what the expected behaviors are. And you'll, you'll see this being utilized more and more. Uh, I addressed in previous discussions the importance of, of marine protected areas, no-take marine protected areas. This, these are critical tools in the toolbox of protecting the ocean, and we really need to do all we can to support these and others. Uh, the recent uh, biodiversity uh, uh, conference uh, was an important step in this, in this regard. There's more information at the link on this, by the way. And we see even the, the tourism industry beginning to take hold. The, on the left, this is the, uh, the passport visa stamp uh, for Palau, essentially promising that people will behave responsibly for the future generations of the island. And then in uh, the appendix of my book, there are some uh, guidelines on just what are appropriate conditions, circumstances, et cetera, for a, a dive operation to be considered you know, environmentally uh, sustainable. You'll also see individual operators taking measures such as uh, ocean encounters in Curacao. This is their sustainability pledge, becoming more, more and more the norm and not the exception. And recognize that your money does make a difference. People, uh, divers don't often understand that the you know where we spend our money has important consequence just by virtue of the incredible amount of money that's spent through dive travel and in marine tourism in general. And I won't belabor you with the details. You can look at this uh, later in the video, but bottom line, we spend lots and lots of money, $19 billion, in fact, in dive tourism alone. And that gives us a voice at the table. So be considerate in terms of where you spend your money. Uh, there's also an issue recently brought up of what we call blue carbon. This, these are ecosystems that are able to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And there's nothing new we've talked about for a long time, planetary. Well, it turns out that marine systems are far more efficient at pulling that CO2 out of the atmosphere. And you kind of see from the illustration there that it's mangrove salt marshes and seagrass meadows that really pull a lot and sequester much of the carbon, not only in their leaves and, 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 uh, and trunks and wood, but in the uh, anaerobic soils that they uh, maintain in the process. And this is just uh, you know a reiteration of things I, I mentioned, uh, I think back in January, that we are in a serious state of affairs with you know, most of the coral reefs of the world under or soon under threat with the very distinct possibility of losing 90 plus percent of them by the middle of this century. So we really need to do all we can. And blue carbon, I think, is one of the ways that, that can happen. That kind of relates to the next point because one of the most carbon intensive activities we <laughs> elicit as divers is getting there, airplane, you know, for, you know the trip getting there. And in fact, 8%, we believe, of the carbon emissions globally comes from uh, commercial aviation. Very, very significant amounts. But there are ways that we can do something about that through what we call a carbon offset programs. In other words, these are programs that calculate how much carbon is being put into the atmosphere and then in turn 
making a donation to pull that much carbon out of the atmosphere through some uh, project. Most recently, the Ocean Foundation has put together a carbon offset program that you can log on to, and it utilizes blue carbon initiatives and programs to do just that. Uh, I'm going to the Philippines later this year, actually in two months, and I took a look at what that 18,000 mile round trip uh, would do. And the calculator determined that it was just under, it would, it's going to put just under, uh, uh, well, 2.9 uh, tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. And for $5.80 uh, could contribute to a program, in this case, a, a seagrass restoration program to pull that amount of carbon out of the atmosphere. And we're seeing that, in fact, uh, people are willing to do that if they know it's available. Uh, diving often involves seafood, and I would you know, ask you to be responsible in that regard. Uh, the Seafood Watch program you see illustrated in the lower left, uh, that's great. It's been around for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't really deal with the tropics except for Hawaii. Uh, but I did come across recently this uh, document from the from the Healthy Reefs for, for Healthy People initiative in uh, in the Mesoamerican area, and it's uh, designed specifically for the tropics. and And bottom line, uh, you want to avoid fish that spend their lives on the reef: grouper, snapper, parrotfishes, and in their case, triggerfishes. Apparently, and. Thus, I was pretty appalled when I, I saw this uh, on the internet recently with these uh, spearfishers from the Bahamas and this uh, beautiful uh, uh, rainbow parrotfish taken. Uh, we don't want to do that. These are too important as lawnmowers of the reef, keeping the algae in check. So be responsible when you do engage in, you know, when you do make seafood selections. Another consumer issue has to do with sunscreens. I'm not going to belabor the details. Essentially, the chemicals that are found in sunscreens listed on the right there, according to their potential hazard. And the last keep the last bullet point there, understand that reef safe doesn't mean anything legally or even industry wide. You can put reef safe on a on a bottle of Clorox if you wanted to. There's nothing preventing you. Uh, you really need to look at the, the chemical components, the constituents, and make sure that what is listed on the right. Uh, personally, I either use uh, 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 products such as the Stream and Sea uh, or good old zinc oxide. Most importantly, I always wear a hat and I always have a long sleeve rash guard anytime I'm out in the sun. And uh, actually, the stream and stream to sea folks, uh, Autumn Bloom and her company, have done a wonderful job in, in disseminating this information and making us aware of just what tiny amounts can have such important and, and detrimental consequences. Very, very small amounts measured in parts per trillion. Uh, so, you know, do your part. And it's, as you'll see, it's not just skincare products. Uh, again, what happens in particular with coral reefs and why it's so deadly in this regard is in the larval stage, uh, they're very, very vulnerable to these chemicals and they either prevent fertilization or settlement uh, or they actually help to induce bleaching in adult corals. So just be mindful of the stuff we're slathering on before and let's try to minimize it through other ways of protecting But it's not just that. When nature calls, uh, a lot of the chemicals that we ingest or put on our skin are not entirely or at all processed and are just passed through urine into the environment. Uh, and many of these chemicals that are part of products that you would never assume end up in the ocean as a result of uh, you know, inadequate wastewater treatment or, in fact, even uh, modern advanced wastewater treatment doesn't remove many of these uh, chemicals. It's really our responsibility to take this into account before we, we use certain products. And then finally, the choices we make when we are a, a tourist can really drive home 
uh, the problem. Obviously, if we're taking organisms that used to be res resident on coral reefs, we're contributing to the problem. But even choices such as carvings from uh, exotic hardwoods provide a market to go out and chop those woods down. But it's more than just trinkets. If we look at the problem of deforestation, the two big issues happen to be the demise of, of, of forests for uh, commercial palm oil production. Here you see an image from Borneo. And then uh, cattle ranching in the Amazon. These are two highly destructive practices that really demand awareness. If you think, well, I don't eat palm oil, check the ingredients. Uh, you, you can almost not find a processed uh, product that doesn't have palm oil. And I would assume many of the uh, of the listeners are certainly beef eaters as I am myself, but we need to learn to be responsible about with that. So how do we influence others? As I said, we need to play storyteller. We need to ex we need to convey what we're seeing underwater and not just the, the pretty beautiful, you know, spectacular stuff. We need to make sure that they understand what's wrong as well. So in doing that, I would encourage you to take this approach. We want people to understand the play, not just the actors. The play is the ecology. How does the system function? The actors change depending on what ocean you're in or even where you are locally. But if they understand the play, they understand the, pop, the problem potentially. Try to engage people by emphasizing unique and bizarre things. Some of you may remember uh, from previous discussions, uh, I seem to spend a lot of time on a phenomenon in biology called coprophagy, which is eating poo. Well, I'm obsessed with that because it's it's such an engaging topic for people, especially who aren't divers. So those sorts of things. And, and generally, think in terms of stories, not facts. You know, you can convey an idea by giving someone a textbook, but you can convey that idea better by giving them a novel about what it is you're trying to get across to them. So think in terms of stories. People remember stories, they don't remember facts. Keep that in mind. Recently, another little uh, interesting little book was published by the, the former uh, head of interpretation at the Buck Island uh, National uh, Park in, in uh, St. Croix. And what uh, uh, Chuck Weiger has, has done here is he's, he's put together 25 little chapters on stories about organisms on coral reefs that are really unique and engaging. And I, I would really encourage you to take a look at that as some a repertoire to, to talk to people about coral reefs. And also engaging experiences. I carry with me a little vial of uh, fluorescein dye and periodically to show the incredible pumping action of uh, sponges and their important role as the kidneys of the reef uh, show that they are able to indeed pump 10 to 30,000 times their volume every 24 hours. This has been uh, amazingly uh, influential in people's attitudes, by the way. And if you want to really make it uh, make an investment, there is a course maintained by the Green Fins organization, which you've seen many of their materials in this presentation. This is an online course that basically takes you through in, in certainly more detail than I have about what best practices are all about. And I, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at that. And then lastly, we've got to get kids involved. We really do. And one of the, the best uh, approaches, uh, aside from the the, uh, the programs that are being offered by Dive Ventures, uh, is uh, NOAA's uh, Planet Stewards program. And the, the link to this is also on the website. So with that said, Let's turn attention to, uh, as I said in the travelogue this time, Southern California, and what I kind of consider the redwoods of the sea kelp forests. Uh, the two trips in particular uh, that are offered are to Catalina Island and to Santa Barbara Island to kind of give you some perspective. I, I spent many, many days uh, diving these two sites and some really magical experiences. People will often ask me what are some of my favorite dives, and I, I always recount a day on San Clemente Island with 100 feet of visibility and, and kelp, you know, more than 100 feet tall. 
I mean, it, this is truly a magical experience. Uh, the good folks at the uh, Phoenix location uh, uh, provided some information here, thanks to Joe Napper, some photos and uh, some information on some upcoming dives. And if you if you look at the the cost benefit here, uh, a lot of bang for the buck, relatively inexpensive for the kind of the amount of diving and the very, very unique creatures and ecosystems that you see you can see in this in this realm. Some of my own images from long ago, these were taken back in the 80s. Uh, and uh, as I said, just an absolutely magical experience uh, being in this in this forest. So I would strongly encourage you to uh, look at that. Yeah, it's cold, but with modern thermal protection, uh, particularly the new semi-dry suits, uh, I, 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 it has never been an issue in my in my experience. Now, a couple things about kelp forests. They're they're kind of the antithesis of of coral reefs because coral reefs exist ideally in low nutrients, and they need warm water. Coral reefs require high nutrients and cold water. So ironically, these are pretty much the mirror images of each other. And they're an amazing, very, very unique ecosystem. I was able to find a couple of really good videos, which I uh, put in the uh, link uh, that I would encourage you to take a look at. And it just so happens as I was doing some research, uh, the new site Vox has a really wonderful article on uh, the mysterious <coughs> forests of the earth. So what I thought I would do is just kind of end with uh, a, a quick video. It's only four minutes uh, by one of uh, what I believe probably the finest uh, underwater cinematographers uh, in the world today, uh, Howard Michelle uh, Hall. So let's <laughs> quite so. Hi, Alex. I think your audio is cutting out again.
So you are sorely mistaken if you think all the wonder in the ocean is only on coral reefs. It is, certainly is not. So uh, that's pretty much it. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I want to I thank particularly Joe Napper and uh, Dwayne Despine. They were very helpful in uh, giving, me, giving me some guidance on the California component of this. Uh, and hopefully you can join us next month where we're going to be talking about fluorodiving, which is basically diving at night with an a, a ultraviolet light. It is a completely uh, unique experience. Even if you're an experienced night diver, this is something uh, completely unimaginable. And I uh, hope you can join us. All right. Yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute and ask them or put them in the chat. Um, Alex, I actually have a question. Um, I have a friend on and she is not a diver, but I'm wondering um, that you covered a lot of amazing information, but I'm wondering those who are not divers or not divers yet, what are some things that they can do if to be good ocean stewards, even if they're not diving? Well, essentially, you know, keep in mind that what whatever you put in a drain <laughs> is likely to event, end up in the ocean. And, uh, you know, just be mindful of, of you know, you know, do things that uh, don't put things that shouldn't be there, uh, even nutrients. Uh, uh, obviously, anything you can do to reduce your carbon footprint is going to be uh, useful and important. Uh, you, you make seafood choices everywhere. So uh, make sure you understand, you know, the source of your seafood and its st sustainability status, the the link to uh, uh, the uh, uh, seafood watch that I have in the, in the materials in the on the website, you can get uh, lots of information on do's and don'ts on seafood choices. Uh, you know, um, try to re reduce or eliminate as many foods as possible with palm oil. Uh, be responsible in terms of uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully you're not eating beef every night of the week. Uh, maybe even consider one day without eating any meat at all. Uh, you know, things of that nature. And and most importantly, you know, understand that just because the ocean may be thousands of miles away from you doesn't mean it's unimportant. You know, and convey that image to your your friends, your family, your kids, et cetera, because no ocean, no life. It's you know, it's it sounds trite, uh, but it's absolutely true. We life would not be on the planet without the ocean. And it won't be uh, if it if it dies. Anything else? Awesome, thank you. I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, so uh, if anyone... I, I have a question. Go sure, go ahead. I don't type so well. Uh, I've been trying to participate in some sort of, uh, I guess, help the ocean, help the world, sort of travel. I've come across the Coral Restoration Project in the Keys, and th they offer some days where you can take a half a day class and then actually go, I guess, plant coral, if that's what it's called, or is is that, do they actually need that sort of help? Is that a beneficial thing to them, or is it more of for them to get the word out about what's going on and how they're helping? Uh, I, in my former life as a college professor in the Keys, I worked with uh, CRF and, and the other organizations very closely, and I absolutely can tell you that they they need the help. It's a labor intensive process, and if if everyone who did this had to be paid, it would not be viable. Uh, they work with about fifteen hundred volunteers over the course of the of the of the year, some of which are residents, and they help you know consistently, but. Overwhelmingly, these are guests who are in the Keys diving for maybe a week or so and participating in, as you've described, a, it's typically a one-day program or where you, you spend some time in the classroom learning a little bit and then going out for a two-tank dive, either doing nursery maintenance or actual transplantation. Uh, so by all means, uh, the Coral Restoration Foundation, uh, Reef Renewal, uh, Eye Care, Moat Marine Laboratory, uh, many of the dive operators in the Keys today sponsor uh, these experiences uh, quite regularly. So if you want to send me a, a quick email, I'll be happy to give you some more direction, but I would strongly encourage it. And it's not just the Keys. These are, at last count, there were nearly 50 
uh, sites throughout the Caribbean alone where these these programs are in place and in dire need of, of volunteers. Uh, thank you. I will send you an email. I, I would rather spend most of my vacation time being productive than just eating, drinking, and looking around, I guess. So that's completely, I think it sounds that's completely consistent with what we're seeing in in, in the travel consumer trends. The whole phenomenon of volunteerism has really taken off. And, you know, people want to do more than just rest and relax. You know, they want to come back. They want to be challenged and fulfilled as part of their, their leisure experience. And I think you're right in line with what a, a uh, what, what's estimated, um, you know, more than 10 million people uh, uh, in North America alone participated in these kinds of volunteer, volunteerism activities. So I, I applaud you for that. I guess I probably shouldn't talk about the airplane ride. I need to get there. <laughs> well, you know, just you know, give a couple of bucks need to, to pull the CO two back <laughs> in, and, and you're, uh, you're you're cooking with gas. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great lecture. Thank you. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Um, we Gary did put in the chat. It doesn't look like it's a question, but. Gary would like to connect to start building an ocean steward type of training class or series thereof, and then listed the contact information to reach them. Okay, I'll follow up with you, and uh, uh, maybe we <clears throat> maybe we could arrange a Zoom call, and I could give you some direction on uh, how to go about that. I actually had several conversations of this nature at the DEMA show this past year uh, with the release of my book, and so I've... Uh, I can give you some uh, some direction by all means. I'll follow up, I promise. Awesome, thank you, Alex. Also, not really a question, but I did kind of want to add to your slide on how our dollars go really far with being good ocean stewards. It just made me think of the countries that, I know you said Palau had their passport pledge, and then also I know some countries have marine park fees that visitors have to pay, and so, it's just kind of a good reminder that those fees aren't just like, oh, they just want my money. Like, no, that money is going to helping those marine parks to help protect our oceans. You're absolutely right. And the people will support. In fact, we think that people will support even more so than they do currently if they're just asked, provided that they understand trans transparency, that the money goes to the protection of the resource and it's... You know, there, there's no corruption, or you know, the, the money is actually getting to the person, to the in, to the entity. Uh, there are some uh, parks now going to an online system where there is no transfer of cash, so you don't get into the potential theft and corruption. Uh, and indeed, parks are recognizing that people want to see exactly what their money is, what's happening with their money. Uh, so I would uh, absolutely concur with you there, and and. Gosh, you know, I, I've ne I've never been, uh, you know, sorry to pay. You know, I think it was it's forty dollars in uh, blood air, and in some locations it's even more. But uh, good gosh, it's a small price to pay to keep a resource from going down the drain. Agreed. And then Dan asked if Diventures is offering any volunteer oriented trips. Dan, I know right now we are going to try to work towards that. We do. We are offering a trip to Curacao with Seacor, so they're an international coral restoration organization, a nonprofit. Um, they do a lot of work in Curacao, and I know Bonaire and a lot of other countries. So on that trip, um, I don't know if I would say it's necessarily volunteer, but the founder of Seacor is going, and you get to see hands-on their coral restoration techniques. So it's a really cool opportunity to see to possibly see coral spawn in real time. I mean, it's nature, so we can't guarantee that we'll see coral spawn. But um, the goal is to see it spawn and see how they collect it and then visiting their lab to see how they help with that restoration. Um, as Alex mentioned, and then Dan, as you mentioned, with the Coral Restoration Foundation, that outplanting and the fragmenting. So just kind of seeing their process and how they do that. It's a really cool opportunity. So and then hopefully down the line. We can do more trips with them and then other organizations as well that help with different volunteer opportunities. I know in Bonaire, Alex did mention Reef Renewal. They are really big in Bonaire where people can take classes and learn how to be good coral reef stewards. So there are organizations and hopefully we can create 
more trips in the future as well that relate to these um, opportunities. Yeah, and Dr. Patterson, the, the head of CCOR, did a webinar for Dive Ventures that uh, you may want. I think that was recorded, I assume, uh, Sabrina, the, uh, the, one, the program that he did uh, a few months back. Ye Yes, I believe it was recorded, and he is also, this is coming up in our newsletter, but he will also be doing another webinar on June 22nd. That information will be going out online, but that webinar will specifically talk about their work in Curacao because that's where the trip is to, so that will specifically talk about what they're doing to help the reefs in Curacao. So be on the lookout for that information. It will be the day after Alex's webinar. So back-to-back -back fun webinars for you in June. We'll have our cool floral diving night, reef night diving on reefs, and then our C-Core work in Curacao webinar. So June will be a fun month for webinars. Super. All right, and then Autumn put in the chat, being an ocean steward also starts with taking care of our local waterways like lakes and rivers. Consider spending a few hours picking up trash at your favorite lake or river spot this summer. So yes, as Alex mentioned, even though we're thousands of miles away from oceans, at least here in Nebraska, everything you do still impacts the ocean. So I know we are going to have different waterway cleanups this summer with Dive Ventures, so be on the lookout for waterway cleanups with Dive Ventures or just local organizations, or you can even reach out to friends and family to go clean up waterways around your area. Indeed, that's why I put the uh, trying to find it. I put the watershed of the uh, Mississippi River <laughs> here specifically. So, uh, in yeah, you, you want to talk about connection. Uh, when you dump something in the local stream, uh, you know, the Gulf of Mexico is going to be the first. Uh, and then the loop current actually brings it right past Florida and up into the Gulf Stream. So you're, you know, water water is a, a, is constantly connected. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's salt or fresh. It's all the same. It's all part of the hydrosphere. Yeah, everything is connected. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Does anyone have any last questions before we wrap up? Thank you all so right. much for putting it all together. And thank you for taking the time, by all means. And please feel free to uh, get in touch. I'm always open for any uh, questions or feedback. If you think there's a way to improve what I'm doing, I, you know, I, I try to do this. I, I don't profess to be the best person in the world, but... Uh, the way I improve is by feedback. So by all means, let me hear it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I hope to see you next month for our Floro Diving webinar. Indeed.